I'm not angry anymore. I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. There's a lot that I can um, forgive, but there needs to be conversations and then in order to, for reconciliation, and part of that has to be accountability. Everything's long and hard about which word to choose. He ends up with the verb forgive, and thus assumes the role of the protagonist in his and Megan's victim narrative, the one waiting to be asked for forgiveness, rather than the other way around. With the upspeak, his first sentence construction foreshadows the upcoming conjunction, but Linguistically, everything that follows this conjunction is the focus of what someone's trying to say, what they really want to get to. Thus, the part about accountability is assigned special focus. Megan likes this word too, about other people, of course. This is what she had to say about her feud with Catherine. Did you make Kate cry? No. So where did that come from? Was there a situation where she might have cried or she could no, have cried? No, no, the no. reverse happened. And I don't say that to be disparaging to anyone. She did what I would do if I knew that I hurt someone, right? To just take accountability for it. I protected that from ever being out in the world. It made me cry and it really hurt my feelings. Okay. And I've forgiven her, right? Mm -hmm. Like Harry, she assumes the role of the protagonist who forgives other people. And implicitly, she points to admirable personality traits, such as being able to take accountability if she hurts someone else's feelings. Even though this entire interview is a study in how to avoid accountability. But you didn't hear that from me. Forgiveness and accountability. It's almost as if Harry and Meghan have aligned their narrative somehow. It's interesting and that Meghan claims that she's not trying to be disparaging to, be to, disparaging anyone. to anyone. First of all, anyone is distancing language, as it's about Catherine specifically. Secondly, she goes on to be disparaging to Catherine. It's almost like a meme. It's projection. It's something speakers say when they know they're about to do the very thing they say they won't do. It's also interesting that she acts as if it's difficult for her to say what really happened, according to her. The interview is carefully coordinated. She knows exactly what Oprah will ask her. So her reaction here is about as real and authentic as Jimmy Fallon's laughter. It was, I was shocking to me as well. I mean, <laughs> Giddy up, I, was like, <laughs> I was like, let's. Oprah was almost too open about their coordinated effort. The most important thing for them, you know, before I do any interview, I have a conversation with uh, whoever I'm interviewing and ask, tell me what your intention is, and I will tell you what my intention is, and let's see if we can align those two, because I don't want you to finish an interview and at the end of the interview say, I wish I had said. And um, but, but by assuming the roles of forgivers right away, they anticipate objections. It's a way of setting the agenda right from the get-go in order to avoid counter questions like do you expect your family to forgive you or something more subtle. Also, if conversations are what Harry wants, it might not be the best idea for him to make himself look innocent at William and Catherine's expense in a so-called documentary that no one asked for. That's the very opposite of initiating a conversation. It's a way of aligning with viewers that you don't even know against your family. They were happy to lie to protect my brother. They were never willing to tell the truth to protect us. When someone who's marrying in, who should be a supporting, a supporting act, is then stealing the limelight or is doing the job better than the person who was born to do this, that upsets people, it shifts the balance. Funny how deliberate attempts to appear innocent always end up making the speaker look guilty. That's a lesson you can't learn from watching Suits. If conversations and reconciliation are what Harry really wants, he probably shouldn't have written a book describing fights with William and unflattering details about Catherine. Come to think of it, it's astonishing to hear Harry talk about reconciliation when he's done everything in his power to cause chaos. Harry knows he's being disingenuous, another reason for anticipating objections right away. Within the family as such, there's a, a spare and the air. Mm -hmm. um, my brother being the heir and me being the spare. And so I think it was just a really good opportunity to choose a, a title that had been somewhat used against me for a long part of my life. 
and own that title. Now we're getting to the heart of the issue. What's really bothering him? That he wasn't born to be a king like his brother. He says the title spare has been used against him, a, but he prefaces that claim with the hedge somewhat and with rising intonation, asking rather than stating. As a result, it sounds like he knows that it hasn't actually been used against him. Unintentionally, however, by saying this, he reveals that it's sensitive to him, that it's something that's been troubling him and that he's used against himself. Thus, when he claims to have owned the title, nothing could be further from the truth, because looking at the Netflix documentary, book, and recent interviews, all he does is talk about the past, an uncharacteristic trait in people who have actually moved on. Harry keeps using the and spare presupposition to make his case, another excuse in an extremely long line of excuses. His life is, is planned out for him, whereas for the spare, Mm, that's not really what you should do. You should kind of be sitting there a little bit in the monarch shadow and just wait your turn. With the impersonal pronoun you, this is distancing language. He doesn't talk about himself. He's using the air and spare presupposition to point to his own situation, as if what he's saying is objectively true in all air and spare situations, which, of course, it isn't. The hedge kind kinda of adds to the unassertiveness of Harry's claims. Hitches express uncertainty rather than certainty. Harry and Meghan both throw claims and excuses at the wall in the hopes that something will stick. And the inspiring Oprah interview taught us that any excuse will do. No one thought to say, oh, you're American. You're not going to know that. That's me late at night Googling how, what's the national, I've got to learn this. I don't want to embarrass them. I need to learn these 30 mm -hmm. hymns for a church. The many excuses and the obvious projection in regard to word choice make it difficult to take their victimhood seriously, especially knowing the amount of money that the two of them have made despite a noteworthy absence of a specific talent. Most celebrities are famous for something, acting, singing, directing. Harry and Meghan are known for complaining about the press. The press that's actually been profitable for them. The alleged false news stories have paved the way for interviews, a podcast, a Netflix show and a book. The irony of their complaints is almost too obvious. You get a chance to tell your story now. Your brother may never have that chance to tell his side of the story. Are you sympathetic to that? This is a much needed question because Harry's unnecessary revelations and complaints are too easy because he knows that his father and brother won't or can't respond. However, Harry will probably say that that's because they're trapped, as he did here. I myself was trapped. I was trapped, but I didn't know I was trapped. My father and my brother, they are trapped. So Harry was trapped. He just didn't know he was trapped. I wonder who entrapped him with that idea. By calling his family trapped, he implies that he's now free. But free to do what exactly? Attack the people who are trapped, of course. Even if we were to accept this framework, free versus trapped, this isn't how free people act or should act towards people who aren't. Harry's been as public as possible with private problems for more than two years now. Even though he and Meghan just wanted privacy, that was their original narrative. Thus, his actions have demonstrated that he's not free, that he's very much stuck in the past. There's a noteworthy discrepancy between words and actions here. Also, the fact that his father and brother can't respond doesn't mean they're trapped. Harry deliberately overlooks that there is such a thing as image. A person who's president can't say whatever they want about certain people either. By that logic, would Harry call a president trap too? Harry is bound to evade this question. Let's focus on the virtue signaling way in which he does it. Notice his initial self repairs, indicating how problematic the question is. Yes, 100%. And I think, you know, after, after I've done this, the book comes out, I would hope that other members of the family feel as though they can write their own book. Yes, with all the unnecessary details about his family and an entire documentary dedicated to criticize and ridicule them, even down to how they curtsy. I'm sure that was Harry's intention all along. I mean, it's not like he wanted drama because he knows drama sells. 
No way. Harry knows there won't be any counter-response in the foreseeable future, which is why the interviewer asked the question in the first place. Harry's response is very telling. Rather than take accountability, he continues praising himself, as if what he's done paves the way for dialogue and freedom, when obviously the opposite's the case. Because all we've heard are Meghan and Harry's monologues, documenting that they aren't free, but very much trapped in the victim role they've created for themselves. To use Harry's own terminology, which sounds strangely inspired by someone else in his life. Harry's asked about what his mother would think about his relationship with his brother. I think my mother would realize the missed opportunity with Meghan being part of the institution, part of the monarchy. Whenever there's a hint of a personal responsibility question, Harry is quick to defend himself by blaming the other party. It's a defense mechanism that's improved over the last two years. When Harry uses the verb realize and the definite article the in the missed opportunity, he presupposes that there is something to realize, the missed opportunity. In other words, he presupposes that he has the truth on his side and he uses his mother's positive image to make his case. But what missed opportunity is Harry talking about? Did he not hear Meghan's excuses in the Oprah interview? Let's hear some of them again. I can't include all of them because this video has to end at some point. You know, unlike what you see in the movies, there's no class on how to, how to speak, how to cross your legs, how to be royal. There's none of that training. That, no, no, I mean, even, no, but even down, yeah, sorry, but even down to like the national anthem, <laughs> no yeah. one thought to say, oh, you're American. You're not going to know that. That's me late at night Googling. Does this sound like someone who made an actual effort to try to fit in this privileged life? Does this sound like stereotyping was the real problem? No, given this context, it sounds like blame shifting, just like the concepts forgiveness and accountability that were used as projection. What we do have is substantial evidence that Megan knew exactly what she went into. In the next clip, we hear what Megan had heard before marrying Harry. But my British friend said to me, I'm sure he's great. You shouldn't do it, because the British tabloids will destroy your life. And I very naively, I'm American, we don't have that there. What are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense, I'm not in tabloids. Given her excuses in the Oprah interview, it doesn't sound like she really tried as she claims here. I really tried to adopt this British sensibility of a stiff upper lip. I tried, I, I really guess. tried, um, but I think that and it doesn't sound like she went into the marriage naively, unlike what she also claimed in the Oprah interview. I will say I went into it naively, mm -hmm. because I didn't grow up knowing much about the royal family. It wasn't something that was part of conversation at home. It, she says, I will say, which displays unassertiveness, unintentionally pointing to other possible interpretations. Having seen my family and the institution's part, in constantly feeding the British press with lies, mistruths, mis disinformation. The only way that I can correct those mistruths is by writing something, <laughs> the truth, in one place. Harry should be allowed to write whatever he wants. The other side to that is that he should then also be able to face the consequences. For someone who claims to want reconciliation from writing this book, he chooses counterintuitive ways of bringing it about. Harry claims to have the truth on his side. He says that what he's writing is the truth, and not simply his side of the story. By inference, then, anyone who challenges his claims and confessions is a liar. However, we don't need inferences, because Harry flat out says that his family feeds the press with lies. In conclusion, then, the words reconciliation and conversation are exposed for what they are virtue signaling excuses that are either untrue or very much secondary to Harry's mission. Last time I checked, calling someone a liar wasn't an optimal basis for a conversation. They pitched the Waleses, right, of which Kate and William are, are now, against the Sussexes, me and my wife. They pitched Kate and Meghan against each other. They did. So it wasn't Harry or Meghan. This stuff's confusing. Meghan herself brought attention to the feud, 
Remember when she said she didn't want to be disparaging, but she went on to be disparaging. Let's rewind. A few days before the wedding, she was upset about something pertaining to, yes, the issue was correct, about flower girl dresses, and it made me cry. Harry and Meghan's true adversary is their own statements. Do you think that this book is going to bring them back, or are they going to further divide you? I have thought about it long and hard, and as far as I see it, the divide couldn't be greater before this book. This is the first part of his answer, and it begs the question, why is the divide so great? It wouldn't have anything to do with going on television to share private problems, would it? Calling his father and brother trapped and all of a sudden being upset about the lack of protection. Short notice that security was going to be removed. It's not safe. It's not secure. But wait, it couldn't have been the lack of protection that made them leave, could it? It was Megan's mental health struggles, right? I went to a very dark place as well, but I... Oh, sorry, it's me. It was the terrible ordeal about learning the national anthem. My mistake. Also, this isn't a sincere answer to the question. The question was about whether or not the book would divide them further. Harry's saying that he doesn't think that the divide could be any further than it was before the book isn't an excuse for writing it. But I genuinely believe that if me and my family can reconcile, can put our differences behind us, but first there needs to be conversation and accountability. And if that doesn't happen, then that's very sad. But I will focus on my, my life. The more intensifier speakers add, the more it typically means that we should be skeptical of their claims. I was probably a lot like each of you, young, ambitious, advocating for the things I deeply and profoundly believed in. Here, Harry prefaces believe with genuinely, that he genuinely believes. But what is it that he genuinely believes? Interestingly, he doesn't tell us. He's right in the middle of a conditional clause, starting with if, when he makes an abrupt self-repair and inserts the conjunction, but initiating a contrast instead. This way, it isn't his unspecific repetitions of reconciliation that are assigned focus. As we observed in the beginning of the interview, it's the accountability he assigns focus. He and then goes on happen, to talk about if it doesn't happen, that, suggesting that he knows my... it's not going to happen. And thus, that his talk about conversations and reconciliation has about as much depth and urgency as an episode of She-Hulk. With the second but conjunction, my, he assigns focus life. to his life rather than the presumed sadness he would feel if reconciliation doesn't happen. In conclusion, Harry's focus is Harry. His language reveals as much. I'm not angry anymore. There are things that will still anger me, but I'm not angry anymore because I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. And where is that? Complaining about the past and making money off the past. What happened to feeling hurt about the Queen's decision? I think that, yeah, I mean, the decision that, what, as of last week or whatever it was, mm. um, is that they will be removing everything. Are you hurt by that decision? I am hurt, but at the same time, I completely respect my grandmother's decision. I would still love for us to be able to continue to support those associations. Yeah. Oh, that was two years ago. True. But the documentary was from last year, and the books from this year. And what's changed exactly? They've done interviews, documentaries, books. But what are all these about? They're about the past and trying to clear their names. Everything they do, including Megan's Brave podcast, directly or indirectly has to do with their past in the UK. So even though both of them act like they're done with the past and that they're happier than ever. So to meet again here on UK soil with him by my side makes it all feel full circle. Their many reactions to old articles demonstrate that they're stuck in the past and that they need to hold on to the past in order to make money. Anyone can look happy in a photograph, but once again, there's a discrepancy between Harry's words and actions. You would just see it play out. Like a story about someone in the family would pop up for a minute and they go, we gotta make that go away. But there's real estate on a website homepage. There is real estate there. Every single member of the family, senior members of the family had been, including the Queen. And on the front page of the Telegraph, Megan. I went, 
Oh my god. I've said a lot, but this final short clip says it all. Notice Harry's reaction. Recently, you lost your grandmother. Did she ever express that she was upset at you? For what? Answering questions with questions is often a sign of deception. It buys the speaker more time to think about their answers, and they avoid having to tell an outright lie, at least for a little while. Here, however, it's a deceptive practice for a different reason. Harry knows what the interviewer means, whether or not the Queen was upset at Harry for leaving the UK. Everyone in the world knows what the interviewer means, cats included. Harry's response is consistent with what we already know about him and Meghan, that they don't feel or pretend not to feel responsible for what they've done. They made the decision, and they're now facing the predictable consequences of that decision. But their sense of entitlement doesn't allow them to admit that, publicly at least. Denmark has the same problem. The spare, Joachim, has expressed that he feels like he's living in the shadow of his older brother, the heir, Frederik, that nothing's defined for the second born. Joachim's expressed much sympathy for Prince Harry's decision. Harry and Joachim have both decided to see the glass as half empty, rather than half full. However, in my opinion, leaving out of bitterness doesn't solve anything. You can escape physically, but not mentally. Harry's constant talk about the past, about good times too, shows that he might be living this privileged life in the US. But his mind is still back in the UK. The good thing about things being undefined is that you get to define them. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos, click the like button and subscribe. What do you think about this interview? Let us know in the comments.